he's looking around uh, and he sees uh, another chair that had, would have belonged to uh, his older brother and one to his older sister and then he sees his little chair and then he sees that there are presents under this dead tree but the presents are all wrapped up and still shiny. And, uh, and he's thinking, I'm going to look into that and see, see what my present is. And then he hears his dad's voice saying, no present, son, until the other little ones come. Um, and suddenly, he's in Times Square. And he describes the, the vehicles and uh, jostling with each other like they're logs coming down a big sluice. And he looks over and he sees these, I think I mentioned this image to you once, you know, these old men coming out from the uh, dirty movie houses and their pants are drying at the crotch and they, and they're squinting against what remains of sunlight and wishing they'd stayed inside a little bit longer. And then he sees a policeman on a horse and he's the policeman, some kind of Dago. And, and then in Bellevue, blocks away, he hears a woman screaming and she's chained to a bed and uh, she's screaming because her hair has been uh, uh, hacked short. And uh, suddenly he's in the, uh, in the Bitterroot in Wyoming. And uh, he's, uh, he remember, he's rem remembering, I think, Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce tribe and 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 uh finally he says uh but tell me will i never find what we're in what was in that present for me under the tree and then the poem concludes uh all the items listed above are parts of the original dream that I am trying to find the logic of. Now, the, the logic is after the fact. This is the process by which the pain of the past in its pastness is converted to the future tense of joy. Uh, by which process he means the poem itself, the act of art itself, which testifies to a unity which is not apparent in any of the seemingly unrelated images. But this process that we undertake as artists uh, is the process by which everything which seems merely fanciful uh, and which, as being merely fanciful, is imprisoned in the past, the pain of the past in its pastness, in its seeming unrecoverability, is once again brought to life and conjugated into the future tense of joy. And I suspect that if, if you ask the poet, he would say, that's the present under the tree. Um, now, uh, uh, so that, that's uh, certainly identifiable, understandable, perhaps more so in the sort of lyric expostulation of poetry than in what we take to be storytelling, you know. Um, but uh, the reason that I read to you from Paul and I was saying, look, look at the way those images uh, take over each other. Um, the images that, which are uh, 
the resources of the poet uh, and which generate their energy from their proximity to each other, not from their intrinsic content, uh, are nothing but characters to the storyteller. In fact, you know, characters uh, uh, in the abstraction are just like the letters of an alphabet. Also, if, my, if I weren't so far along towards senescence, I had meant to bring uh, Kierkegaard's uh, essay, uh, The Sickness Unto Death, where, uh, and read to you, uh, and I'll, I'll do it if we're all alive tomorrow, where, where uh, he gives an abstract formulation, a series of characters about which defines despair which will just make you laugh. It's so ridiculously incomprehensible. Uh, despair, uh, one form of despair is the self willing not to be itself, and another form of despair is the self willing to be itself in the self, with the self, in the fucking gear. And you say, hey, give me a break. Yes, that's right. It, the self which does not relate to itself is, is in despair. And the, uh, and if you're so fucking smart, what's the conclusion of the syllogism? <laughs> yes, but I mean, do you remember the, the rhetoric of it? The self resting transparently in the spirit which gives it rise, the, uh, the absence of despair is the self resting transparently in the spirit which gives it rise. Rather than conceiving of itself in relation to itself, it conceives of itself and acts resting transparently, allows God to flow through it. And um, that's what art is. And the renunciation of the forms of despair, which are the premises of a story, which are arbitrary, and which must ultimately produce uh, a sense of the self as separate from God. Uh, and the resting transparently in the spirit which gives it rise is working without a plan but in faith. Um, and that's what is available to us of faith as artists if we testify in behavior. But uh, these abstract syllogisms that, uh, that Kierkegaard pre presents the self willing, uh, the self not willing to, to be itself is one form of despair. The self willing to be itself is another form of despair. Uh, and uh, and what, what I wanted to go on to say is, then this guy gives concrete examples, which is uh, in a, a sermon he gave when he was younger, which in its specificity is so beautiful and makes you ache the same way, for example, you know, when you read Dostoevsky or something, and you're thinking, oh, this guy's been walking with me, what the fuck? You know, it's just, it, you know, here's this crazy Dane, and he, he knows exactly what you felt as you stood in the first snow on a football field in Buffalo, New York, when you were 14 years old, you know? Um, and that's because in certain moments of composition, we rest transparently in the spirit which gives us rise. And no matter how talented you are, if you don't rest transparently, if you try to impose a form uh, based on a preconception about what the other expects, you're in despair. Uh, and there is a despair which does not know itself as despair, 
which you know drives a big car and uh, it gets the other gratifications uh, which I will not be guilty of yielding to expressing yet again. Uh, and just can't exactly figure out why it isn't happy. And so in that residuum of discontent, starts to tell war stories about the bosses. They kept them from, or her, from telling the right kind of story. Nobody ever keeps you from telling the right kind of story except the lack of faith. And, uh, okay, now, how do you get to faith? Uh, the, the, the thing is, it's, it's, it's so much easier than you think to act in faith as an artist. Uh, and the first, because, uh, and I, you know, in previous talks that I've given, have, have talked about certain writing, certain exercises that uh, are available to you, uh, which really are just prayers. It's just a way of praying, but they're writing exercises where you don't think about, you're not allowed to think about what you're going to write before you start to write. You're not allowed to think about it. You can only write with two voices, no narrative, no narrative voice. It's just, and you just label it voice one and voice two. And then whatever the fuck they say is what they say, and you can't write for less than 20 minutes, and you can't write for more than 50 minutes. And when you're done, you put it in an envelope, and you seal it, and you stop thinking about it. And all of that is a way, uh, a, a corollary of this proposition is, anything that you think about writing, when you are not writing, it is false, false, false. Anything you think about writing, when you are not resting transparently in the spirit which gives you rise, is an expression of despair. The outline is an expression of despair. Having my pencils ready is an expression of despair. Um, and if you want to approach it psychologically, the ego, which, which is the I am, everything that you think about your work separate from you is the ego, the I am, thinking about something separate, which Kierkegaard would formulate as the self not willing to be itself. Um, the, and, and therefore, as predicated in subject-object, which is the contradiction of what art does. Now, a corollary of that proposition is that the job of the ego is to affirm the sense of reality which it perceives. Because if I am, the thing that I'm seeing is what affirms the I am. If I ain't writing, then the I am affirms the fact that I don't write. The ego extrapolates as a permanent condition what it apprehends in the instant. The form of despair that that will take is, I don't start to write. I ain't ready yet. I don't know the story well enough. I, whatever comes to hand for the ego, the ego will use to justify staying in whatever state it's in when it begins to conceive itself. Therefore, the exercise that, that one suggests is arbitrarily to begin and therefore to avail oneself of the 
structures of the ego, even though you are no longer in the ego, which is you'll find that when you're writing, everything that you thought about yourself as being, oh, I'm not ready to write, I don't know this, I, I need to know the story better. Now when you're actually doing it, you come up with all sorts of, well, I don't know it exactly, but I mean, listen, uh, you, you have to begin somewhere, don't you? you say, and, and all you're saying, all the ego is doing is saying, you're writing now. You know, keep going. And what you'll find once you've begun is, oh, I don't want to stop. Now when I get to I don't want to stop, then you're back in ego again. So you have the arbitrary, that, that's why I set up these arbitrary, it, the, the arbitrariness is what the Grand Inquisitor spoke of, uh, of as miracle, mystery, and authority. Seal it, let it go, give it to God. But what you will find is that the processes of the ego uh, ultimately to the extent that we incorporate them in our neurons, which is after all, all that association is. Neurons are in proximity to each other. The, the synaptic connection is bridged by the electricity of association. And if we habituate our egos to a form of behavior, ultimately we begin to take it as an essential nature, just as we took it as an essential nature that we can't write. All you're saying, uh, all that's happening is that the the synapses, have, the, the the neural imprinting has gone far enough. Uh, an example that uh, I, I belabored at a point of tedium is, uh, you know, oh, oh no, we're still going. Um, you know, when you start trying to drive. I'm never going to, I can't do this, I can't do this, it's, it's, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's this, it's step on it. What are you doing? What are you doing? Whoever's teaching you. The fuck is wrong with you? But over the course of not very long, you habituate yourself such that you absolutely believe, I've always known how to drive. I don't know, that's, I, I was just kind of, I'm gifted that way. You know, uh, so um, the the ego, the sense of the stable I am and of what reality is, is simply an operating fiction, uh, and it exists either in a uh, punitive relationship with the superego, which is the sense of the other or it rests transparently in the spirit which gave it rise. Um, now, uh, uh, so that if you're just embarking on the process of writing, uh, these exercises will get you to uh, uh, will will open the door for you to uh, the state of being uh, in which it is responsible to con to begin to conceive stories after you have habituated yourself to the process of of uh, of resting transparently in the spirit, and then the trick becomes not to stop resting transparently once the story has, has begun. And it was that that I was referring to, that, that process uh, that I was referring to when, when uh, I, I was talking about the way that Paul, uh, after all, you know, this thing about Paul as a writer, that's what Paul was. Paul, uh, as, as I told you, you know, Paul would go from place to place and, and, and uh, get the shit kicked out of him by the Jews, and then he would preach to the Gentiles. And then the moment that he was no longer in the moment, he would fall back on ego 
And he would think, these ingrates, these no good fucks. They're probably back to fornication and speaking in tongues and every other fucking thing. Let me write these cocksuckers and I'll give them a thing or two to think about. And then the moment he began to write, he was once again in the spirit as he had been when he was converting them. And so his, his letters, which are after all just pieces of writing, uh, which always begin with the intention to rebuke, very quickly transmute uh, into testimonies of the, the spirit of the community of the spirit. Um, those are successful series. Corinthians, right up there with the Sopranos. Um, and, and uh, uh, when we now begin to encounter the, 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 the premise for a series, I want you to be aware of the fact that, uh, you know, if God is anywhere, he's everywhere. And so you can get from wherever you start, inevitably, if you rest transparently in the spirit, you're going to get to God even if you start out thinking of Del Shannon and whatever else the fuck you're thinking of. If you, if you stay with it and don't allow yourself to be distracted by, well, do you understand me? Do you understand me? Is that enough? Do you understand me? Or will you pay me? Even if you don't understand me. Now, we get to the symbol, will you pay me? Uh, as the, uh, to the extent that something is abstracted, it becomes both more manageable and less meaningful, more susceptible to distortion. So, uh, and, and, uh, I've, I've spoken in other circumstances about, uh, what defines us, what distinguishes us as human beings is the capacity to signify, to represent a reality by a symbol. That's why storytellers, you know, are by, by dint of the gift of allowing the symbol to rest transparently, and a story is simply a symbol of the process of creation and by allowing it to rest transparently in the spirit which gives it rise the story is the least distorting symbolism of the creative force of the universe to the extent that the symbol is regarded as autonomous and in fact a separate reality uh, and that can happen very very quickly it can happen with a great series, it can happen, happen with the cross, so that what starts out participating in the reality which gave it rise suddenly becomes autonomous and it can ward off vampires and uh, it can be used to intimidate the Indians and make them give up all of their crops. Uh, the symbol can be distorted to all sorts of purposes. Um, and the, the, the effort for the writer is constantly to resume his or her position of transparency in relation to the energy which his work testifies to. Um, now, how do you do that? You know, uh, if you look, uh, uh, speaking just, uh, you know, solipsistically, which is my wont, uh, you know, if you look at, say, uh, uh, NYPD Blue, Deadwood, 
the, the thing that uh, worked on most recently, John from Cincinnati with my colleague, Mr. Nunn there. Um, uh, those seem to be very disparate, but in, in fact, the, uh, the idea of, let's say, this gold as generating, as, for, as initially simply a lie agreed upon, uh, a, a symbol into which uh, men and women are able, by agreeing upon the meaning of the symbol, to organize themselves and liberate their energy. Um, the internet, uh, which uh, John from Cincinnati was trying to get the surfers to understand, you know, the surfers who are habituated to finding their joy on the wave, that that the uh, the shared participate. What John would say to them, the internet is big, and and uh, I'll, I'll, I'm not going to go into the epistemology of that show, but but um, the it, in one form or another, every story that works is a story of great distances and starlight which takes place in a moment and century of mania and which is a story of deep delight. And uh, all stories have that in common and, uh, and if the voice of, of the storyteller is subsumed by, is, is rest transparently in the spirit, what seem to be totally different story moments are suddenly perceived as a unity. So that, say, in Deadwood, you know, what's going on in the bar and what's going on in the stable and what's going on in the hardware store, uh, even though these seem to be different characters, feels as if it's part of a unity. And the minister who is who is dying of a tumor quotes from Paul saying that if the hand says, because I'm not the foot, I'm not therefore the body of Christ, is it not of the body? Which is to say, even if we think that characters are separate, does that mean that they're separate? Or does it simply mean that they mistakenly perceive themselves as separate? And if we're resting transparently in the spirit which gives us rise, do we experience them as a unity? That's the paradox of art. And what the structure of a series needs to do is get the fuck out of the way to allow that unity to express itself. And how that happens is by trusting the spirit to organize the materials. Uh, for that to work, the first thing you have to do is to renounce the bosses, the expectations of the other, most of which you are postulating as the expectations of the other. You know, if, if, if I go in to pitch a series, um, if, if I tell them it's a cop show, they will, uh, uh, their, uh, more than likely, their verbal reaction will be great. <laughs> and their feeling will be, geez, but I hope it's not another fucking cop show. Uh, which is to say that we are, that their cohabits in all of us, even the bosses, you know, the dictates of fear, which are, okay, it's familiar, it's a cop show, I can sell that, I can go, I can go to the air, I can say, it's, look, it's a cop show. But then there's something else, which is, but I hope it's human. You know, now, uh, let's talk about our historical, uh, what time is it? I mean, you can't get more historical than that, right? It's 325, it's December 18th. That's history, pal. Um, you know what I, I was I was going to say I, I want to talk about the venue for the delivery of a story and how that complicates a little bit this 
resting transparent, uh, resting transparently in the spirit which gives us right. Go on, get out of here and don't come back, you fuck. That's Mark Tinker. He's a friend of mine. Um, but let's take a little bit of a let's let's take uh, forty-seven seconds off. Now, starting now. Let's. You want to talk about something else? I just want to. I just want to stop thinking for a minute. He's got a lot of explaining to do to those little kids, doesn't he? I didn't do it, he says. You gonna believe me or your lying eyes? What do you think? Uh, is is uh, do you nourish the secret suspicion that uh, this doesn't apply to you as writers? Everybody else is gonna get it, but me. That's just fear, you know. If you just go to work, if you do these exercises, you can't think about what you're going to write before you start to write. You can't think about it. And then the ego say, well, you can think about it a little bit. He, what's he going to know? Is he going to know? <laughs> that, that is the, the, and the minute you say, what's he going to know, then you're not, then it's the self not willing to be itself, you know? Just do this, do this. Don't think about it. Then whichever two voices come to you, don't, no description. The scene is this. Because you're, then you're setting up a separate communication with some postulated superego. Voice one, voice two, they, nobody needs to understand. And then at the end, by, seal, by finishing and sealing the envelope, you prevent yourself from going back and generate, well, I, l l let me make it a little better. Just let me make it. <laughs> just so he doesn't think you're dead. You, you know, the toughest thing with being a parent is realizing at a certain point, you got to let him go. That the deepest respect, the deepest love, let them go, and uh, you have you have to get to that point with your work. And the reason is so that when you are in connection with it, you recognize a complete participation in which requires. In in the 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 live in the life the voice the being of the character, and the way you do that is is is, is what in the ideal you do with a kid, which is you attempt to participate imaginatively in the creation of circumstances most congenial to the child realizing his or her deepest nature. And then you get out of the way. That is the selflessness of parenting. It's the selfness, selflessness of all kind, of every kind of love. And it's the selflessness of art. Um, that's what you're training yourself to do by sealing the envelope. It ain't about you. And you have to habituate yourself to realize that, and after a while, then once you've habituated yourself, the needs of the ego, oh, just let me make it a little better, begin to erode, and you begin to realize, oh, that's, that's a different living thing. Then you're resting transparently in the spirit which gave you rise. I'm of service to this different living thing, but it is different and that's how I feel.